solutions. Okay, so I told you I wasn't going to leave you sort of like desperate and sort of like having this black sort of like view of the world. Okay, guess what? There are solutions. So the first thing is that 50% of all the energy requirement for 2030 has yet to be built. So we can change the way it's built. We can have solar panels, wind, wave, even fusion. And please let me get rid of a major concern of yours. The fossil fuel industry keeps telling you that it's expensive to have renewals. It's actually, uh, you can't do renewals because actually fossil fuels are so much cheaper. Well, not really, because actually the International Monetary Fund estimates that the fossil fuel industry has subsidies of $5.3 trillion every year globally. That's more than we spend on healthcare in the world that we're spending on fossil fuels to keep them going. Okay? So, if you remove those subsidies, then renewables would be actually very cheap and very uh, affordable. Okay? So I give you an example from San Francisco. This is a conference center that uh, I regularly visit in Moscone, and they have all of their roofs covered with solar panels. Okay? The economics of renewables is very clear and very sensible. Okay? You just need to get rid of the fossil fuel subsidies. But before you go out and blame BP or Chevron or Texaco, those are just the private companies. Out of the 25 largest oil and gas companies in the world, only nine are privately owned. The rest are state, fully state, or partly state owned. Okay? So the problem that we have here is we're not dealing with the business community, we're dealing with governments. So for example, Statoil in Norway is owned by the Norwegian government. Okay? The Russians own part of their oil company. Saudi Arabia owns the whole of their oil companies. Okay? And so what we're trying to do is try to remove state subsidies on these companies that are skewing the whole market system. Okay? So, but the biggest problem I think that faces most developed countries and soon rapidly developing countries is transport because we can see how to generate power for electricity from renewable sources we can do that reasonably easily but we are all wedded to our cars and our planes which of course use fossil fuels don't get me wrong fossil fuels are amazing okay kerosene to get that amount of bang to get your jumbo jet flying across the atlantic is quite amazing. So the first thing I'd say is green does not equal ugly, okay? So um, top two cars are my personal favorites, and if anybody would like to give me a donation, I'll happily buy one, test it out for you. On the left is the Porsche, and on the right is the McLaren. These are supercars, and they're hybrids, because they've suddenly realized that an electric engine has a much greater torque, and therefore, 0 to 60, you do with a electric engine, okay? So 0 to 60, I think they get down to 2.5, 2.6 seconds, which I think is absolutely ridiculous. I'd like to try it out. Of course, after 60 miles an hour, you need the petrol engine to then get it up to 200, okay? So, but we have down here, Tesla, which has not only basically brought cool to this sort of like the sports car, but also to the family car, okay? So it is possible to do it. I'm also going to challenge you because I think Climate change, we can produce win-win solutions and actually make America a much better country and the world a much better place. So I'll give you an example. High-speed trains. At the moment, China is laying down 11,000 miles of high-speed trains. America has just over 400 miles. Okay? Which seems ridiculous considering what a uh, developed country the United States is. So why is that? And the interesting thing is, America 2050 have actually done the study to show you where you'd have to have these links. You don't have to have a network everywhere because people very rarely fly all the way across. What you find is most of the links are between about eight major cities and actually quite small hops. 
I've put on the right-hand side the Japanese magnetic levitation train that hits 366 miles per hour. So if you're worried about it being slower than a plane, please don't. Okay? So you could build this wonderful network of high-speed trains all around the United States, which means that you would just literally walk into the center of New York with your bag, get on a train, and you could be in Washington in a very short period of time. Okay? Um, I have to say, in London, we have got used to this because we can walk onto a train and we can actually travel uh, very quickly to Paris. Though current politics might mean that that might no longer happen, okay, with Brexit, but we, we'll talk about that at another time, okay? Yeah. You think your country is mad? Welcome to my country, okay? <laughs> so, but before you think that this is out of the realms, this is going to be extortionate, America cannot afford this. Eisenhower, after the Second World War, put through the Highways Act in the United States. They spent over three decades $580 billion at current rate to build the highways network across the United States. For one simple reason. He saw that when Germany was at war, bombing them didn't stop their production because what they'd done was distributed their factories all around the country. They hadn't got them concentrated. Eisenhower was still with that war hat on saw that all of the industry, the military might of America, was concentrated in the Northeast. And he was deeply worried about that because he felt that that could be bombed flat. So he built the highways network hoping that this would distribute the actual business and the actual manufacture around the country. So you've done it before, so these sort of large projects are quite possible in uh, the developing world. There's also market solutions, okay? We live in a capitalist society. I run a company to provide solutions, environmental solutions to companies, okay? To actually take the best science possible. So again, how would we do this? The first thing is CO2 is a pollutant. So we just charge for it, okay? If somebody wants to pollute, you charge for it, and you try and get it out of the system. You could either have a system where energy companies buy the right to pollute, and that slowly gets more and more expensive. We have a cap and trade system like that in Europe, whereby we slowly move the cap down to try and actually force people to move from one energy source to another. You can have goods and services. You can actually embed the price by taxing certain goods that have a very high fossil fuel. Oh, and I saw I should have said the cap and trade was worked out beautifully here in the United States because of the Clean Air Act. When it was realized that your power stations were producing sulfur dioxide, which was causing acid rain, the government decided to actually act. Now, what they did was they said, look, we're going to get you to do a trading system because, of course, those that can convert cheapest can move over first. Now, the industry was up in arms. It was going to cost $8 billion. It was going to ruin us, etc. The cap-and-trade system meant that it was incredibly efficient, and actually it was only about $1 billion to clean up the whole of the power industry in the United States. Now, you can tax, you can do that, and, of course, that revenue goes back into the government, whether it's state regional or federal, and you then use that money to protect people against the effects of climate change. I'd also argue that we have drifted a long way from capitalism. Again, I would argue, and I'm going to talk about this tomorrow, about realigning ourselves to what capitalism used to be, where we need progressive, inclusive capitalism with a triple bottom line. So we actually look at wealth distribution and we look at both the economics of running a company and running a business. We look at the environment because we need to fully cost that in. But we also look at the social because, of course, it's no good having loads of money in a very small percentage of the people if most of the people are miserable. Okay? Capitalism has been an incredibly powerful tool for developing the world. But in the last three decades, we've shifted to a much more extreme version that seems to only um, be good for a very small percentage. So, to sum up 
some of my thoughts to try and be a bit more positive about the world. Population growth is not the elephant in the room, okay? We could support a much larger population than we have now if we distributed the wealth and the resources of the world more equitably. We know that, okay? We know that, and all of you know that in your gut, that if you share out goods and services, we can support lots more people. Overconsumption is more important than population. So it's not the number of people you have, it's how many surfaces they use and how much embedded fossil fuel is actually involved, okay? Again, it's interesting me having to talk to young people about a completely different style when you say, why don't you get something fixed? And they look at you and go, no, I'm just going to buy a new one. No, no, get it fixed. No, I'll just buy a new one, okay? The given different mindset has occurred, and I have to say, I've suddenly realized how old I am. Um, a reduction in... So, universal access to family planning. Okay? This is something globally that's really important because it helps us undergo the demographic transition, but it also fulfills the basic human right for women to choose. Okay? So it's interesting that climate change comes back down to human rights. Reducing carbon emission produces win-win solution, ranging from health benefits. The medics that I work with Celebrate climate change because it means that they can tell people they have to get on their bike, exercise more, eat less red meat, and become healthy human beings. Okay? So the medics see this as a very positive shift. Energy security. I get maddened by uh, my government and other governments around the world. Why do I have a country that wants to be beholden to Russian gas? Why do you want to have a country that has to rely on oil from the Middle East when you can generate all your energy internally? Never quite understood that. So solving climate change can also lead to a better country and a better world if we do it right. But the key thing is always good governance, both regionally and internationally. And so it's essential to protect people. And so for one of them, the thing is to take the way of the case of the food prices. Countries should be able to try to protect their people for their basic services like food and water. And we have to think about that. And there, to last but not least, I do not think there is any fundamental reason why we need to abuse the natural resources that we have available. And I'm going to leave you with the wonderful cartoon from US Today in 2009 by Joel Pett. And this was just before the Copenhagen conference, uh, the climate conference, which you know actually ex basically imploded. We had to wait till last year in Paris for us to actually get a proper international agreement. And it says that we could actually have energy independence, preserve the rainforest, sustainability, green jobs, livable cities, renewables, clean water, air, healthy children. But what if it's a big hoax and we've created a better world for nothing? Thank you very much.